1534, during his search for a northwest passage to the Orient, Jack Cartier encountered the coast of Labrador. A land of stone and rocks, frightful and ill-shaped. For in all the said north coast, I did not find a cartload of earth, though I landed in many places. In short, I deem that this is the land God gave to Cain. Cartier's description of the coast of Labrador was more a reflection of his impatience than it was a fair assessment of his location at the time. To many explorers during the late 15th and early 16th centuries, the coast of Labrador was dismissed as a series of islands and wasteland to be contended with on what was believed to be a short cut to Asia. History knows the folly of this notion, but the efforts of these notable explorers opened up the possibility of settlement by Europeans along these shores. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador consists of the island of Newfoundland and a region of almost 300,000 square kilometers bordered on the south and the west by Quebec and on Canada's east coast by the Atlantic Ocean and the Strait of Belle Isle. My name is Dermot O'Reilly and I'm your host on this journey through Labrador, a part of the province rich in history, cultural diversity and natural resources. Welcome to Cain's Legacy. The Strait of Belle Isle has been a busy shipping lane for almost 500 years now. Known to the Basque whalers in the early 1500s as the Grand Bay, this area of the Labrador coast is linked to the island of Newfoundland by the St. Barb to Blanc -Sablanc Blanc passenger ferry. It's just over 11 kilometers from the Quebec community of Blanc -Sablanc Blanc to the provincial boundary with Labrador. Like the Quebec shore, the fishing industry is the primary focus for commercial activity along the coast of Labrador. Control of this resource was a principal element in the colonial rivalries between the French and the English. The use of the land by the French before 1763 is very much in evidence here in the place names of some of these small communities. The Treaty of Paris in 1763 terminated France's claim to Labrador and facilitated the operation of an English summer cod fishery which led to true settlement here in the early 1800s. My father was born here on Labrador, my grandfather comes from England, from Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight. Yeah. The pioneer settlers who came to coastal Labrador were mostly from England's west country and the Channel Islands. 
After 1850 and until around 1875, people from Newfoundland's Conception Bay area began settling here to work at the fishery using Red Bay as one of their main centers. Before Jack Cartier's voyage of discovery in 1534, Portuguese, Breton and Basque fishermen had been operating on the west coast of Newfoundland and along the southern coast of Labrador for at least 20 years. Initially attracted by the cod stocks, the Spanish Basques began to concentrate on whaling, establishing a number of ports in the region. The most significant of these was here in Red Bay. As well as the documentary evidence, the presence of red clay roof tiles from the Basque installations helped to initiate archaeological digs here in 1978. The land excavations have revealed the remains of at least 20 workstations, or triworks as they are known, where the whale blubber was rendered down to oil. The work of the archaeologists, while solving some mysteries and uncovering new ones, continues at the site. The materials uncovered by the field crews are carefully removed to be catalogued and stored at the laboratory for further study and research. The Red Bay site has become the focus of international attention, which led to the development of a visitor center where artifacts and recreations of the technology and personal belongings of these ancient whalers provide a unique insight on what is regarded as the first major industrial complex in the New World. Over 8,000 years before European settlements were established here, a people known to archaeology as the Maritime Archaic Indians lived along these shores. Close to one of their ancient encampments overlooking Lansom Moor is the burial site of a young Maritime Archaic boy who was interred with a high degree of ceremony, making this burial unique as an archaeological discovery. From what is known of the maritime archaic peoples, the coastal region was their preferred habitat, with the sea providing for all of their needs. Later arrivals to the coast of Labrador were the Paleo-Eskimo groups, who were in turn succeeded by the Dorset culture, and like their predecessors, left a legacy of endurance in this land of extremes. The coast of Labrador, north from the Straits, is dotted with communities, all of which depend on the sea for their survival. As well as the permanent settlements, there are a number of once thriving centres, now abandoned or in use as summer fishing stations. Battle Harbour was first established by the merchant family of Slade in 1795 and grew from a summer fishing station to a community of about 300 people in the late 1800s. Having its own hospital, the first to be established by Sir Wilfred Grenfell, and with its own school and church, Battle Harbour was the principal commercial and fishing centre for southeastern Labrador. In less time than it took to be established, Battle Harbour as a permanent community fell victim to forces outside of its control and has become again a summer station for the people from nearby Mary's Harbour and for the merchants from Newfoundland. As a focus for the cod fishery in the early years, Battle Harbour has much to offer as a historic site. Restoration of the community to a living museum is underway and when completed will transport the visitor back to the days of the pioneer settlers. The cod fishery alone was not enough to sustain a resident population along the Labrador, but combined with salmon, the seal fishery and fur trapping, a successful year-round enterprise was possible. The community of Cartwright was established in 1775 by George Cartwright, who recognised the value of a combined resource base and advocated the cause of permanent settlement. Well, he was an unusual figure, but it's quite amazing that a fellow like him would come from England and 
stride across Labrador the way he did. Did a lot of fish, a lot of dried fish, uh, salted fish, did a lot of salmon, uh, a lot of in the Cooper trade, you know, Cooper was in the barrels, uh, salted, pickled, um, did a fair amount of that. A lot of fur, and was very keen on getting fur. Fur was very highly prized at the time. In Cartwright's time, hunting and trapping along the Labrador was limited to the Innu and Inuit families with whom he traded and to the small winter crews of the English fish merchants. Over the years, the balance has changed, creating more demand on the resource and increasing the need for regulation and conservation. Well, the district that I've been assigned to uh, comprises of approximately, um, oh, I'd say 10,000 square miles. You've got about 200 miles of coastline and, uh, and back about 50 miles in, in the country. It's a difficult area to, uh, to patrol and, uh, and control because of, uh, because of the geographic uh, location of some of the, you know, the communities are not accessible by roads and, and things of that nature. And we, had, we do have a large number of communities in District 27. For Harry Martin, a native of Cartwright, the job of conservation officer provides a unique opportunity for reflection on his homeland. This particular job, you know, is excellent from the point of view of uh, being inspired, especially the type of songs that I like to write. But uh, the countryside and uh, the old way of life and things, that, uh, things like that. Cause I've seen the mountains Into the sea and all of the beauty is like heaven to me where the wild birds are flying and the caribou. Many places I've rambled, but this is my home. Many places I've rambled, but this is my home. The rugged coast of Labrador belies the lush interior of this vast region so casually dismissed by Jack Cartier in 1534. By the late 1600s, French fur traders had traveled in through Lake Melville to what is now known as Northwest River. To a fur trader in the 17th century, Northwest River offered many elements necessary for a successful business venture. The river for transportation, the deep woods, and of course the abundant wildlife in the region all contributed to the establishment of the first year-round trading post here in 1743. I, th I think it was one of the better trading posts. There were several located in, in the Labrador area. There were some uh, further north. There was one on the Churchill River, but this seemed to be the good place for a trading post because the boats, uh, the big boats, could get in here with the supplies and it was a traditional Indian traveling route from the St. Lawrence River on into the highlands in Labrador. Lloyd Montague, who operates wilderness camps for adventure tours, grew up in Northwest River. His great-grandfather, who came from the Orkney Islands in Scotland with the Hudson's Bay Company, established a family name here. Northwest River was known at one time as Fort Smith. And uh, you know, I think it was 18... 87 that it was changed to Northwest River. So who, who was Smith? Smith was uh, Sir Donald Smith, the, the guy that drove the last spike in the railway, Lord Strat Corner. He came to Northwest River in 1836 and he stayed here for 20 years. And at that time he had his gardens and it, it was a little paradise in the north. And he, he more or less uh, made the town of Northwest River. From its early days as a trapping community, Northwest River has become a medical and educational center and offers retail and commercial support to the neighboring community of Sheshishi. 
Well, as a child, I used to come down here a lot. Uh, this was always a center of activity for all the kids in town, and we'd gather down here and play our games on the beach and try to swim, and, and uh, I have a lot of fond memories of, of hanging out here on this beach. For Shirley Montague, an entertainer and former resident, Northwest River continues to have a strong influence on her writing and performances. Well, I come from a trapping family. Uh, most of the Montagues uh, were trappers. And uh, when you grow up in a trapping household, so to speak, I mean, you are quite affected by that kind of lifestyle. It, it's sort of uh, something that uh, is deeply rooted, you know, in your, in your soul, I guess. Oh, do you know the lake they call Lake Melville? It's the biggest lake we have in Labrador. And I know the trapper boys are always ready to hunt and trap along Lake Melville shore. Moon shines bright tonight on Old Grand River On the hillside where the breath of trappers lay Through the snowy bush the candlelights are burning All along Old Grand River to the bay shines bright tonight in Northwest River and the northern lights are shining out their gleam but we hope to make them shinier and brighter for this is what we call a trapper's dream there's another place that we just can't forget, boys. It's our next door neighbor here to us, we say. It's the old Grand Lake and Unescopy Rivers. As they're flowing out their waters to the bay. Thank the Lord for sparing all those trappers As he's often done so many times before And we can't forget to thank him for his mercy For we are the trappers' sons of Labrador No, we can't forget to thank him for his mercy, for we are the trappers' sons of Labrador. In the early 1940s, as the war in Europe escalated, the search for a North Atlantic ferry route for military planes and personnel to Britain led to the construction of the giant air base at Goose Bay, just 30 kilometers from Northwest River. As the largest of the bases established in Newfoundland and Labrador during the war years, construction of the Goose Air Base provided thousands of badly needed jobs and affected profoundly the traditional lifestyles of the people of Labrador.
After the war, the base continued to operate as a training and servicing facility for the Allied forces. I mean, these uh, men over here are engine specialists. And they are In recent years, the base at Goose Bay has become the workplace for former adversaries. British, German and Dutch military personnel, along with Canadian technicians and pilots, continue to utilize the base for training flights and aircraft maintenance. Before the base was established, the village of Mud Lake was the only permanent settlement this far up the bay. The construction of the base saw the birth of the community of Happy Valley. There was nobody living here in this, this particular area. In 1943, they had asked the settler people to move uh, five miles outside the base perimeter and uh, Gilbert Saunders, Thorwald Perrault, and John Broomfield took a motorboat one day and come around and come up through and uh, landed pretty close to this body. And when they were coming into the land, the other two had long rubbers on and Gilbert Saunders had on shoes. They were gonna carry Gilbert in. And he said when they were getting close to the shore, he jumped because he wanted to say he was the first one to set foot here. <laughs> yeah. The first families to build their homes in what was to become the community of Happy Valley were from Big Bay, Davis Inlet, and McCuvick on the north coast of Labrador. Since that day when their three canvas tents and personal belongings were unloaded on the riverbank, Happy Valley Goose Bay has become a major commercial center and distribution terminal for all of Labrador. In the Happy Valley Goose Bay area, the various cultural and ethnic groups who make up the population of Labrador are much in evidence. The majority of the first settlers here were from the coast of Labrador and from the island of Newfoundland. This cultural mix finds expression in the crafts of the people and in the music, which continues to be a strong reflection of the Labrador mosaic. Labrador's Inno population, the so-called Montanay and Nascopi people, are concentrated in Shechishi, across the bridge from Northwest River, and at Davis Inlet, about 290 kilometers north by air from Goose Bay. Until the early 1900s, the Inno of Labrador lived and hunted in the interior and made occasional trading expeditions to the coast. By this time, the caribou on which the livelihood of these ancient hunters depended was in decline. By the 1930s, the people themselves had suffered greatly from starvation and disease, and their numbers, which had once been in the thousands, had fallen below 300. With the help of the Oblate missionaries, the Ino have recovered from virtual extinction and continue to work to preserve their traditional way of life. <laughs> the Mukashan ceremony is the focus for the religious and cultural expression of the Ino of Labrador. This festival, which celebrates the spirit of the caribou, the animal that traditionally provided food, clothing, shelter and tools, is held after a successful hunt.
我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，我那个，
The 20th century saw the tragic demise of a significant number of the Moravian centres on the Labrador coast. The buildings at the abandoned site in Hebron, north of Nain, are a poignant reminder of the changing times. A combination of flu epidemics, administration and logistic problems, and a changing political environment led to the resettlement of the residents of five mission stations to the communities of Hopedale, Makovic and Nain. Like the other communities along the coast, Nain continues to reflect its northern and traditional character while adapting to rapid change. Although the transportation of people and supplies must still contend with the extremes of the northern climate, improved communications help to soften the effects of isolation. The Inuit and European settlers who have made their homes here continue to utilize the resources of the sea and the land and to introduce improved processing methods in their traditional economy. The emphasis on education by the Moravian Church saw the establishment of the first school at Nain in 1791. Literacy in the native language, which was fostered by the missionaries, is still encouraged by the current school administration and remains a choice for the students of today. Ma. Although the Moravians in Labrador are no longer involved in the economic and secular aspects of people's lives, their legacy of dedicated service over the years remains as a distinctive element in the cultural life of Labrador. buying a car now? Just your average smart buyer. Profile Peter Bishop, accountant and smart buyer. Peter took advantage of 5.9% financing for 48 months on his new Mercury Topaz. He gave me the kind of numbers that really added up. Profile Susan McIntosh, teacher and smart buyer. Susan saved big by getting 5.9% financing for 48 months on Escort. I did my homework. Your Newfoundland Ford and Mercury dealer smart buyer clearance is on now with low financing or cash back. We give you more. You can make a change, you can make it happen. Start a coffee calling. It's time to make a good move, time to take control. Start a coffee calling. You can do it, we can show you how. You can do it. Start a coffee college now. You can do it. A new low-flow shower head will give you all the hot water you need at about half the hot water cost. Call us, and we'll tell you how to clean up on savings. Now there's a number that can help you save energy and money on your electric bill. The Power Smart number at Newfoundland Power. Call it for information that'll add up to savings for you. Now, when life turns up the heat, there's Degree Antiperspirant. Because it's body heat activated, Degree turns on extra protection when you really need it. Degree, your body heat turns it on. The United Nations forces, if they fail, it could mean war. Now there's an element of risk in playing that role, but we're soldiers, we're professional. Walking a delicate line, a CBC documentary special, Caught in the Crossfire, Tuesday.
I've heard it said all the best men are dead And I'd be the first to agree Cause they were a breed who were driven by need And a love for life that was free Though their numbers declined There once was a time When the trapper was more than a man With his home on his back You could follow his track From the coast to the height of the land Across the lakes and the streams He followed his dreams The poor man would work like a slave And he struggled to win But he lost in the end It was only a race to the grave At the end of the day He would unload his sleigh He would count all the miles he had come He'd gaze at the flame and he'd whisper her name It seemed such a long way from home He'd twist and he'd turn as the warm fires burn How he longed for the touch of her skin The aches and the pain nearly drove him insane As he waits for the day to begin Across the lakes and the streams he followed his dreams The poor man would work like a slave And he struggled to win but he lost in the end It was only a race to the grave Yes, I've heard it said all the best men are dead And I'd be the first to agree Cause they were a breed who were driven by need And a love for life that was free And a love for life that was free The Churchill River was the gateway to the trapping lines, really. The full length of it was the trapping line. Most of those trap lines were handed down from father to son, father to son. Uh, on the Churchill River, we started off with, the, I think, the Hopes. There was a Michelin Nicks. There was a Monocue Nicks, the Groves Nicks. Then the Blakes, I think the Blakes were uh, quite a ways there. And then the Goldies, you know, Becky's in between. Except for the trappers and the Inno families who lived and hunted in Labrador, very little was known about the interior until the late 1800s. By the time of confederation with Canada, however, the mineral wealth and hydro potential of Labrador had been recognized and became the focus for industrial development by the province. In 1967, after more than 10 years of studies, negotiations and planning, construction began on the Churchill Falls hydroelectric development. To harness the power potential of the falls, the river was diverted at a point above the original falls and a reservoir which is more than one-third the area of Lake Ontario, was created on the Labrador Plateau. The diversion of the river increases the drop from the plateau by a thousand feet. The water follows the new channel to the plant area and is funneled down through the penstocks to drive the 11 turbines in the huge underground powerhouse. Access for trucks and heavy equipment to the underground complex is provided by a mile-long tunnel which, like the powerhouse, was excavated out of solid granite. The powerhouse is the heart of the Churchill Falls hydro development. The 11 power generating units with their individual control panels are monitored and maintained on a strict schedule around the clock. For such a giant project, 
with the capacity to meet the electrical needs of three and a half million people, the central control area is surprisingly compact. From a construction camp which housed over 6,000 workers at the peak of activity, the population of the Churchill Falls community in the wilderness of Labrador's interior remains at a little less than 1,000 people now. The isolated status of the community continues to change, however, with the upgrading of the existing access road and the ongoing construction of the Trans-Labrador Highway, which will link Goose Bay with Churchill Falls and Labrador West. My good old new be home in the year of 61. I decided to come to Carroll to see what was being done. From Ross Bay Junction to Carroll, it took us quite a spell. Cause the slowest train that I ever rode was the QNSNL. Oh, the slowest train that I ever rode was the QNSNL railway, which was constructed to transport iron ore from Shefferville in Quebec south to Settile, travels through Labrador West and is a link to the communities of Labrador City and Wabush. The economic base for the two communities is the mining and processing of iron ore, which, combined with the Fairmont development in neighbouring Quebec, represents more than 80% of Canada's iron ore output. The significance and extent of the iron ore deposits in Labrador West was first recognized by the geologist A.P. Lowe in 1892 during the Canadian Geological Survey at the time. Uh, when he first saw the, the outcrops at, uh, at Cambrian Lake, uh, his first comment was that the iron ore here must be reckoned, reckoned in millions upon millions of tons, and in those days that was, that was uh, quite a bit. Improvements to the methods of iron ore processing brought the original assessments into the billions of tons, increasing the viability of a mining industry in this isolated and challenging environment. To meet the challenge, thousands of individuals brought their skills and labor to this new frontier in Labrador. By the time the mining and processing of the ore had begun, the communities of Labrador West had their first permanent residence, and the province had entered a new industrial phase. Well, I took up some drinking, and I did me some thinking, got a ride with a friend down the coast. I boarded a plane, yes, from Deer Lake I came, and I landed at Labrador West. Now the white caps that used to roll free, is white stuff that's up to my knee And the cut throat and guttons no more Cause I'm shoveling up heavy iron ore But I'm a newbie, I'm a newbie With fisherman's ways I've earned all me money the hard roaring way I'm a smell like a codfish on Monday But I was a free man on Sunday they came from all over the world, I would say. From Germany, France, Italy, you name it. And most of the workers were from Newfoundland. Most of the men came up and they worked here and they stayed in the bunkhouses like my husband did until the town was built. And uh, when I came here, right where I'm sitting now, this was country. A little over 30 years have passed since the pioneering days of the towns of Wabush and Labrador City, but the community spirit, which originated in the trailers and the bunkhouses of the early years, lives on in the hearts and memories of the first residents who brought the towns to life. Did I ever tell you about the time I, Joey Small would open the hotel up? Joey came to open the Grenfell Hotel, and I grabbed, I was living up in the old campsite, 
I got on the bus with my two children. The hotel was closed and he and Tori, he had all lived with them. And I walked right into the lobby. I walked up to him, you couldn't mistake him. I said, I'm Lolly McGregor. He says, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he had never met me before. Of the two communities, Wabush, with a population close to 3,000, is the smaller and reflects the scale of the mining and processing operation here. Labrador City, with 10,000, is the largest community in all of Labrador and, like its nearest neighbour, provides access to most of the amenities and services of its less isolated counterparts in the south. The isolation factor in these northern towns is alleviated by a great emphasis on recreation for all ages. Use of the modern facilities by individuals and groups is encouraged in both communities and is a feature of life in Labrador West. I venture to walk on early May morning Through the dew on the ground As the sun shined to deal I spied a wild rose growing there on the mountain And my heart skipped a beat o'er the vision In the flower I saw the face of my darling Its petals her hair and its perfume her smile The stem of the rose was her body so slender As it reached out for life from the rich mountain soil Labrador Rose, you're the rarest of flowers As you blossom and grow by the cold northern stream For the rest of my life I will stay here beside you Oh, Labrador Rose, you are one living dream Morning, I walk through the dew and the sunshine For to be with my flower that grows on the moor There's nothing around to compare with her beauty Oh flower so fair, you'll be mine evermore Labrador Rose, you're the rarest of flowers As you blossom and grow by the cold northern stream For the rest of my life I will stay here beside you Oh, Labrador Rose, you are one Labrador is unusual in it. It was never really settled or conquered. There were waves of people came through it uh, at particular times, and, and uh, the first wave of Europeans was the uh, Norsemen. They weren't really Vikings, they were Norsemen. Uh, and they came through in the, uh, the year 1000. The written history of Labrador begins with the Norse sagas. The Wonder Strand, mentioned in the writings, has been identified as the Porcupine Strand, north of Cartwright. For all of the enterprise of the adventurers and traders over almost a thousand years, Labrador's population of 33,000 is quite small compared to the rest of the province. Since the construction of the base at Goose Bay, 
Labrador has experienced the effects of large-scale commercial and industrial activity. In some ways, though, this great region is still a frontier with enormous development potential in areas of tourism, forestry, hydroelectricity and mining. Labrador has barely been touched as far as uh, the mineral exploration is concerned. Like I said, there's several areas that's been gone over in detail. The rest is just reconnaissance. We're in the process now of trying to uh, upgrade on the information that we already have, uh, but it's going to take it's going to take a long time. But the potential really is unlimited, as far as I'm concerned. Although the value of Labrador's primary resources will always be affected by the vagaries of external market conditions, the people who have made their homes here continue to work towards a unity of purpose and to build on their sense of permanence and commitment, which they hope will live on in the generations to come. A lot of them want to stay. My children have always wanted to stay here. A lot of Labrador kids do, and, and uh, a lot of the people who come here from Newfoundland are, are I think, in, in their, the way they, they love Labrador is equal to the way we love it, and a lot of their kids don't like to leave. But you see, Labrador has a pull on you. If you've ever been here and it's captured your heart, you can't stay away. You have, it keeps pulling you back.